Welcome everybody to our explainability panel. Very excited today to pick up on some of the themes from Laura's presentation before and discuss goals and challenges with creating model explanations. And I'm very, very fortunate to be joined by experts in this field and also some of the people we've been cooperating with in this research. So I will start by briefly introducing the participants, give a very short intro, and then we will kick it off. Uh, so I'm joined today uh, by Molha. Chief Analytics Officer of FICO. So we've already started to talk about explainability earlier. So what is the main idea here? The main idea is that we use very complex models, in this case, in order to construct credit models and to provide credit. But we often have a need to describe them in simple terms. And so the idea of explainability, transparency, and model diagnostic tools here, I would summarize as we have these very complex models we can impossibly tell the user everything about that model because it comprises a lot of very complex functions inside a lot of parameters. So I can't just write it down completely, but I need to somehow summarize its features in somewhat of a simple language. So for example, I take a very complex model and then I just want to extract a few key features and those few key features should tell me something important about the function of the model. Now I would say though that this is about where the agreement about what we're about to do here ends because what exactly it means to summarize a complex model in simple ways may depend on a specific goal. And I don't think there is one agreed definition of what it is. And so to paraphrase something that I heard Debbie Hellman say about fairness, I think the one thing about transparency um, and about explainability we can all agree on um, is probably the idea that it's a good thing and it's a good thing to have. But now the question is gonna be, you know, why do we actually care about it? And we're gonna use that in order to approach and um, how we actually should go about it. Um, so let's get started with that. So actually my first question I would ask the group is, you know, where does the necessity for transparency and explainability actually arise in building credit models? And what are the goals of that? And maybe Scott, I can call on you first uh, to give us um, a quick take on where you see that need arise. And then I'm also happy to open it to, to everybody else. Yeah, happy to do so. And, and thank you for having me as part of the panel here. Um, the explainability and transparency is, is, is really critical in this area of credit risk. Um, you know, many of us are aware of the fact that credit risk is actually deemed a high risk model in the EU. And, and the reason why it's deemed a high risk model is that the decisions that we make with these models um, impact human lives uh, and the trajectory of a life for, for some period of time. And so the, this is considered at the same level of you know, seriousness as we would treat facial recognition and policing with AI. Um, and so when we look at a, a serious decision like making a credit risk decision, um, which will impact someone's life trajectory, um, we have to really have a, with a, with a, with a lot of honesty, a, a focus on what is, how do we explain these models? And so you know, that is where the, the the person who applies for this loan, right, or is impacted by the decision has to definitely understand um, how the model is assessing its decision and score um, that impacts whether or not, let's say, their, their extended credit or under which terms they are. And there's a lot to unpack here. It's a complicated topic and it's a serious topic, but I, I would say, you know, the, the main goals um, in terms of explaining a model would be around these con three concepts. I mean, one concept is correct, right? So an ex explanation needs to actually be correct, meaning that uh, we should not necessarily have an explanation which is an inferred explanation, right? That might be mostly right or right for a lot of people, but not right for the individual. Uh, it has to be actionable, which means that if an uh, explanation is, is provided, um, the consumer needs to be able to take an action, right? Whether or not it's to change their behavior, um, or for them to, let's say, remediate wrong data that went into the decision, um, which has caused them to get a, 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 the, the result that they're not expecting. And the final piece, I think, of explainability at, at a very high level is understandable. Um, we know today that many types of machine learning models impute bias. They learn relationships from inputs. Um, and so we need to really focus on understanding what drives the decision. It's not always the information on the input 
right? It's not the information that gets fed to the model. It's what's learned by the model from a relationship perspective. And so from that perspective, understandable means that we probably need some level of transparency to be able to understand what has the model learned, not the importance of, let's say, the input features. And then moreover, right, the person that's developed the model or who is using the model to not grant credit needs to be able to explain what those relationships are um, in a human understandable way to the person um, on the other side of the table that is being impacted by that model. And so I'd sum it up as, you know, correct, making sure that they're not inferred, actionable so that somebody can act on it and improve their situation and then understandable meaning that we we truly understand what drives these these decisions and we can explain it to that human on the other side of the table uh, and then they can affect that you know their trajectory based on that i think that's very helpful i think it's also very reflected by the research that we've tried to conduct here in kind of trying to connect the technical properties to really some of those properties of can we use that in practice does it provide something that provides a tangible description that may actually use a help? But we also saw a lot of challenges in actually making this more precise, right? Like, what does it mean for a model to be correct? May also depend a lot on a specific use case. So just seeing, I'm um, opening it up, um, whether any others of you want to add to, you know, what, what are some of the, you know, what does it mean to explain what are some of the goals here before we go into to some of the specific tools? Um, Adam, do you want to chime in there as well? Yeah, absolutely. I think you really have to consider the audience, right? So when you talk about who needs the explanations, there's there's uh, several different groups. One is the model developers who can use that information to help make their their models more robust and make sure they're 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 deciding based on reasonable factors in most cases. Um, the second one is oftentimes in financial services is the sort of compliance and audit organization that that needs to validate that. Um, and then the third one, which is perhaps the most important one, is the people who are actually being affected by these decisions. And you know, um, Scott Scott mentioned this, but the the you know in financial services there's there's a really um, uh, you know, there's a history of, of sort of attempting to make, provide that transparency through adverse action codes, which I think is a really positive thing. Um, but when you take these really esoteric data science notions of explainability, in particular feature importance, and try to map them to layperson definitions of, uh, you know, of explainability, whether or not it's um, inferred or direct, it's really difficult. And there's, there's definitely some information loss. It's, it's, you know, the game of telephone technologically. And so that's something that, you know, we think about a lot. It's like, how do you map these sort of explanations in a way that makes sense to the, the end user? And it's very context and audience specific. Um, and so it, it's, you know, it's not something you can do off the shelf. Um, I think that the other, um, you know, talk, the good point that Scott made that I just wanted to add to is, you know, really about making it actionable. And so I think that one of the things that we're really strong believers in, while Lime and Shap and Future Importance is a, you know, maybe a good starting point, it's certainly not sufficient by itself. And so you have to move on. And so there's a lot of other techniques we're really excited about, including things like counterfactuals that we've, we've done a lot of work in that are, are much more action, uh, actionable notions of explainability. And so I think there are, um, you know, there's no silver bullets in this, but I think that, you know, you, you need to kind of make sure that, uh, you know, you're, you're exploring the full range of solutions there. Uh, thanks so much. I mean, that also reflects one thing that I found interesting coming out of this research, which is, you know, the way I think about it, you have this very complex model, you want to describe it in a simple way, you're going to lose some information. I mean, that's the name of the game, because that's all like, you, you can't possibly describe everything. So you have to be very mindful, which information you want to preserve in a specific case. So that's why I liked your, um, your points here um, very much. Okay, so let's maybe um, move on next in a conversation to, you know, how do these existing tools actually address those challenges? And we have some people here who, who's, who are in the business of actually building explanations. I actually, um, all or, or most of you are in the business. And um, so maybe, Krish, do you want to give us a bit of an, an overview from your perspective? How do existing, you know, tools that are available address those challenges? What, what are some of the, the ideas here? Uh, sure. Um, so, so just to uh, kind of second what um, Scott and Adam mentioned earlier, yeah, I, I think the the stakeholder, the the person, the persona for whom we are providing explainability is very very important because even the tools that are needed may differ depending on uh, this persona. So let's let's take uh, so let's start with a persona like complaints or audit or risk team so they may be interested not at the level of an individual lending decision but they may be interested in at the level of um, how the this specific model or or this system is behaving as a whole so for them perhaps the uh, the aspects that may be most relevant may be tools for measuring biases in the 
the decisions made by the model and the system encompassing the model and maybe other business rules and so forth. So they may be interested in, is, is the model behaving similarly across different subgroups? Um, again, like what are those subgroups? That's something that uh, depending on the setting, on the regulations or the requirements, we need to define. And often uh, there may be an emphasis just on measuring with respect to one dimension, but often intersectionality is very, very important. Combining multiple attributes, like for example, gender and race together, that becomes very important. So I think that that's, that's kind of closer to perhaps bias and fairness. So then the, the second persona we could think of would be say the data scientists or the machine learning operations engineers who often may get, let's say a complaint or some issue from say a customer support and they want to debug what's going on. So for them, the tools which help with say counterfactual analysis or tools with, which help um, uh, go back to historical data and analyze which features are important, why a specific prediction was made and so forth. I think those are quite important. And at, at Fiddler also, we provide such counterfactual and what if style uh, functionality as part of our offering. Um, the, the other type of tools that say, let's say data scientists need would be understanding what they need to, to, to improve the models in the next iteration. So for instance, if they understand that uh, features uh, X and Y have become important uh, overall, they would like to understand how can we uh, uh, come up with other features which complement these features or perhaps go deeper into these features. Um, likewise, another aspect of, that often arises, not only in credit lending, but all broadly across many domains is which parts of the data are most important. If they have identified that perhaps some part of the data is corrupted, then they can go and uh, uh, look into whether there, are, there was some, uh, the labels are corrected or we need to get data from different subgroups. And so forth. So this, is, this is kind of related to tools that uh, provide importance of the data you know, in, instead of just the features, notions like data sharpening. Um, the final constituent that we perhaps is most important is the person who gets impacted by the, uh, by the credit uh, decision. For them, I think the different types of tools may be helpful. The tools ranging from uh, articulating why their credit was, let's say, denied to what they can do uh, in terms of recourse. Um, so in this context, I, I, I just want to uh, point to a very uh, insightful talk that uh, Solon Barocos gave in uh, NeurIPS 2020 workshop on uh, fair AI in finance. Uh, he, he discusses the, the tensions that are unavoidable when we go about explaining algorithmic decisions. Uh, so this subtle difference between say providing counterfactual explanations and the reasons behind denial and recourse. So, so depending on which of these goals we are going after the, the tools that we may need, the techniques we may need may need to be slightly different. Uh, thanks a lot. I mean, I, I like that because it reflects a, a learning we had in our research as well, that, you know, there isn't one notion of explainability. It's really about what's the specific question I ask. How can I describe the model to a specific constituent in a way that helps with that specific uh, use case? So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, like, more what other, you know, general approaches are there and, and also how well do they actually already live on that? Mohan, I was curious um, what, what your take is as well. Yeah, I think we've covered a lot. Uh, we talked a lot about sort of feature importance based uh, approaches and counterfactual based approaches. Uh, I think there are other techniques that are so in a, in a similar model agnostic uh, group that those two uh, belong to. Uh, there's a, a set of techniques around rule based explanations. Mm -hmm. So um, sometimes with counterfactual explanations, you might say, you might get answers that are inconsistent, you know, so you've asked me to increase my income by $200 a week and reduce the number of open accounts, but you didn't ask the other person the exact same thing. It feels unfair. Mm -hmm. So rule-based approaches would basically say, all right, every person who makes the less than $500 a week and uh, uh, has less than 10 years of employment history is going to get rejected. Yeah. And so yeah. you understand, uh, you know, uh, fairness relative to other people who you know have applied and not accepted, accepted. I like that a lot. Let me just uh, probe a little bit deeper there. So are you thinking here about something where you have a model and then exposed you want to kind of describe in simple natural language, which is what our whole starting point was, right? Like you want to describe in simple natural language what the difference is, or are you also thinking about actually changing the design of the tool to use those rules in the first place 
to make sure that I, I can it's expand in that so way. So I was what I was referring to now is just I have a model. It's yeah. a, we don't care how the model was constructed, what techniques were used, were they simple, were they sophisticated, <laughs> but we can uh, uh, figure out sort of the rules, extract the rules that always hold that yep. we can use to explain to people the properties of the model. Um, so obviously that's computationally very expensive. Yep. Uh, you know, SHAP is also very expensive. Most people approximate yep. uh, the computation. That's why uh, maybe different tools don't agree. Uh, uh, on how to prioritize the feature importance. And then of course, counterfactuals can be expensive because not only is it an optimization problem, but it's an optimization problem that has to respect these constraints. Like Laura mentioned, you know, you can't reduce the number of, uh, of years of employment history you have, you, don't, you can only go up. Uh, yeah. There are other, uh, other techniques too, that are less popular. Um, so for example, there are techniques that try to explain a model. They're sort of more global techniques, uh, try to explain a model in terms of its average behavior. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are techniques that are very uh, model class specific that might, for example, only work for decision trees. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are techniques that also try to explain a model by showing you examples, you know, that are interesting or salient in yeah. some way. But less, less, uh, I think, less widely used than that. I, know, I find it super interesting because it shows that there is a whole model and so a whole, a whole set of models or approaches that we could use. And then so kind of matching it to the right question is, is probably important. That we already touched on, like in, in my, my question to you, um, and some of the uh, statements you made in the end, where certain tools only apply to certain models, that you know, maybe it's not just about what we have been focusing on our research here, which is taking a model and then trying to describe that black box exposed. So, to be clear here, what we described mainly in our research for tools that took a model that in, in the research case we actually built uh, in many cases. Um, that then were given to our partners and then they came up with explanations, which typically took the form of returning some important features that were important for either an individual decision or for describing a disparity that we found using those models. Now, my question here is like, should we actually maybe think of explainability and transparency um, not just as a postdoc exercise? Um, if we want to actually produce responsible AI, should that already affect the choice of models along the way or what opportunities are there actually for transparency that are not just about the final model? So Laura, what, what's your take on that? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, it, it really ultimately should be part of model design, um, this, this, if you will, view on transparency and, and therefore um, an, an approach that you take or the approach that you take when um, selecting data, building model, um, you know, getting everything uh, up and running should really be fit for purpose, fit for the use of model. As Scott was saying, for more high risk models, you may then therefore make different choices in that design than you would make for lower risk models. Um, so I think that a lot of discussion, um, especially right now in the industry, is focused on this uh, idea of post hoc, and, and there's a lot that can be done post hoc, but we should also be focusing on on how transparency factors into what modeling approaches we're using and what choices we're making in the build of the model as well, not just in the, you know, I built a great model, it performs well on, I'll say, AUC, um, therefore let me figure out now how to explain it. Um, there are much other, uh, more dimensions to be thinking about uh, as far as model performance than, than just that one that I just mentioned. Um, and one of it, I think, really part of that design should be the level of transparency that that um, and the ability you will have to provide um, good explanations um, at the end when you're ultimately using the model. Um, that level of transparency can also make your model a heck of a lot better as well. So if you understand how your model is working, um, you can also make your model work better. Um, and if you have views about ways that data may not represent a full picture of what's going to happen in the future, or may not be, for example, in the, in the, in the example of credit risk, may not be fully representative of the population that you wanna serve. Maybe the population you've served in the past, it's not necessarily the population you wanna serve in the future. Having a greater level of transparency in the model then allows you to add in new input, if you will, outside of the data that you may have to build or train that model to make that model then better once you're deploying it into, into production. Um, thanks, Adia. I, I think this reflects a few interesting points that we also found in research. For example, that actually being able to intervene in the construction of the model in the first place, in many cases, can produce better outcomes than basically taking the model as it is, then maybe explaining it, and then starting to iterate. 
um, and that some more automated approaches um, have potential at least to, to uh, add value there. And that also, I think from a meta point, what I find interesting when we compare the kind of more automated decision-making that goes into building some modern machine learning models is that at least now the process is in many cases more transparent on that level that I actually know what the machine was optimizing for. I know that it was mainly based on this data and maybe I can also probe that process as an alternative to just looking at the final models. So Scott, you've been involved in you know, this process and are an expert in that. So I was also curious on your take on um, kind of explaining the final model and, and just looking at what comes out of it as opposed to also the importance of the, the process of vetting there and challenges and opportunities in, in that realm. Yeah, no, it, it, thank you. It's a, it's a very important topic, right? Um, in some sense, right, applying post hoc analysis to a model sometimes may point to the fact that um, maybe we didn't make the right choice around which sort of model to use in the first place, right? And so, you know, in, in many parts of my business, right, you know, we have a, a philosophy of explainable first and, and predictive second, right? Um, and so, you know, very often we, we get focused on the fact that there are a multitude of different success criteria for, for a model. And sometimes we, you know, because of Kaggle and other things that are out there that, that kind of, you know, get us on this trajectory of prediction as, as an absolute sort of, you know, um, priority, we forget that there are other sort of, you know, important pieces here. And so for, for, for what I look at very often is, you know, the choice of the model is really important. It's probably the very first decision that has to be made. Um, you know, in these areas of, of credit risk, for example, interpretable models are, are very heavily used because we, we need to deeply understand. And it doesn't mean that they don't learn relationships. There are interpretable machine learning methods that can expose the latent features, but they share exact, you know, very clearly what are those relationships um, that, that are driving some of these decisions. Um, and so, you know, I think we should always focus on, you know, the decision of what model to use first and whether or not we have to use the post hoc tools and how heavily we rely on those post hoc tools um, in terms of what our uh, judgments are or our, 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 the quality of, of our outcome will be in terms of whether or not we built this properly. I'd also say that, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions, right? We, we get enamored with big machines and big compute and lots of cloud, and, and we like to beat on our chests and not do the, the, the person next to us in terms of the size and complexity of models. Um, you know, we all know as, as practitioners that the models are all wrong and, and some are useful, and we have to really focus on what is a useful model. Um, and, and so, you know, sometimes we'll talk about, you know, uh, an interpretable model as simpler right, than a complex model. Um, and, and that doesn't, shouldn't be viewed as, as, as not as important or, or, or any less useful. In fact, potentially it is much more useful in terms of the problems we're trying to solve and much more responsible in terms of, you know, making sure that we're using these models in a way that does less harm. And so I, I would just caution everyone to say, you know, that there are these tools that are out there and they'll help you know, with a help try to crack and maybe give you lots of different opinions, both good, bad, and ugly in terms of what are driving some of these complex models. But we should always be focused on, you know, what is the correct model to use in the first place and what is the priority? And fortunately, right, I think the rest of the world is waking up to this. The IEEE sort of guidance states is very specifically in terms of the fact that, you know, build it um, as complex um, as you need to only to meet the objective and no, not any more. Right, and then it places more priority on fairness and more priority on, on explainability. So I think it's it's critically important, right, to determine how much is are we going to put the reliance on a post hoc tool versus at the very beginning choosing the right types of models for an organization um, to to meet these needs that we have for our clients in a responsible and fair way. Uh, can I? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. So yeah, I think we uh, we heard a little bit yesterday. Michael on the panel was saying how. You know, he would love to have a generative process understand how the data was created in the mm -hmm. first place, like what's going on in people's lives mm -hmm. that leads to the data that we have, right? And sort of sort of modeling backwards from there and trying to understand that. And I think in a, a conversation we had before the session yeah. is doing more causal uh, modeling and also choosing models from the get-go and processes really that let you do sort of more causal inference and so on. I think that would be, yeah. That's Something interesting. So I, I think it's an interesting direction to say, you know, maybe we need to understand the data and how it's generated better in terms of some fundamentals that are you know, economically meaningful so that we have models that we are able to understand through the lens. Now, let me say, though, as an econometrician, you know, it's extremely hard to do that. Yes, right? Right. So it's not something we can just easily learn from the data. 
and just, you know, just let's just fit the right model that tells us, as Scott just said, you know, all models are, are somewhat, somewhat wrong. Um, and in, in a way, we also, you know, not always able to do that. So I would actually like to pick it up though. So I think there are a few constraints and aspects we can put on the models. Like maybe we actually want to do more careful modeling that is more respective of causal relationships, or we want to use a simpler model because we think it is easier to describe. So one thing we found in the research is definitely that there is potential of more complex models to improve the, um, to improve predictive power, but also at the same time, if we are willing to you know, optimize them right and have the right oversight, it is a benefit at the same time also in terms of, for example, fairness. But of course, there is also trade-offs. Um, Scott alluded to that, like, you know, like, are we comfortable in a certain situation using these very complex models? So that's curious actually continuing that discussion a little bit about the role of complexity. And is it clear that the simple model is easier to describe? And I, I want to frame this in, in, in the following way, like, in the in the real world, there is complexity. So unfortunately, the real world isn't just a simple model that we can just copy, right? So um, if I have two features that are very highly correlated with each other, um, it's going to be very hard to distinguish between one of them being the important feature, the other one being the important feature, or for that matter, even if a model is quite simple, it may not make a big difference whether it's one of those features, the other features included. So I'm, I'm just curious in general, like what kind of trade-offs we should um, think about. Is it inherently easier to basically um, explain a simple model than, than a complex model. I was curious, like, because we just started a conversation, whether you, you have any other big picture views on that. Yeah, I think it's an interesting question. I, I'm not sure. Like, on, on paper, the model agnostic techniques should give you, you know, explanations independent of sort of the structure of the model. Yeah. But obviously, as you just said, uh, there are lots of correlations and inputs and so on. Uh, they're gonna, it's going to be very confusing. So, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I would. I would hope, anyways, that there's a ton of work going on in, in uh, making explanation explanations work in uh, in, the, in all contexts. Yeah, right yeah. So that we have kind of we can basically deal with those with those correlations. I think you already pointed to one direction, which is kind of trying to understand more how these are also causally related, despite yeah. this, of course, being very hard. Yeah. Um, uh, Krish, I was also curious where you see kind of in your work the role of complexity and and simple models. Like, do you do you think about in your products, for example? constraining the models themselves to be simple or what are the trade-offs kind of between complexity, simplicity, and maybe also some of the other properties we care about like fairness. Mm -hmm. oh, so yeah, this is a really a great uh, uh, topic. And, and as you kind of alluded to, there are trade-offs. Uh, in, in some sense, what we are trying to capture is um, as good of a, yeah, an indicator as to whether somebody is going to pay back the loan, for instance. Um, the, the challenge is that we don't have the exact measurements. The features that are that are typically used in the model are at best proxies for these measurements. Um, in, a, in a potential like uh, a different world, we may we may be able to exactly capture the behavior of the person and maybe the features that capture the behavior of whether somebody is going to pay back or not, or maybe circumstances that will help or not help them pay back or not, but then that becomes uh, that 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 may mean that we may need to incorporate a lot more features and perhaps features that are not just tabular features may be based on uh, their other types of behavior and if they are correlated with the ability to pay back, that also then naturally brings up the dimension of fairness uh, as a society. What are the behaviors that we consider acceptable to be used for making credit decisions. Uh, if, say, somebody is not able to pay back the loan because of circumstances beyond their control, maybe circumstances like health issues or other uh, issues which are beyond their control, do we consider those to be acceptable to be included in the model? I think from those dimensions, uh, it's, simplicity is desirable because at, at the least we can reason how the model is behaving, what are the factors that are being used by the model. Um, but at the same time, I want to just... Um, uh, like, uh, I want us to think about, re, say, domains where we do not have such institutions. Say, think of most of the world where we don't have credit history. Um, so today, a, a number of companies in these regions, say, in uh, emerging uh, markets like India and other countries, are using all types of social and other behavior to make decisions on whether to lend or not. Uh, so now the the challenge for us as a society is, do we say that such decisions should not be made 
or do we mandate that uh, there must be some regulations and it perhaps that may limit the number of people who will get then get the credit offerings but but then the factors that go into those will be limited so i think these are some of the the broad trade offs uh, that i can think of um, and also is uh, often simpler model does not necessarily mean it's easy for a lay person to understand there there could be a, the model could be a simple linear model but the number of features that may be fed into the model may be very large as a result even when we provide the importance of the features for a person who is not familiar with machine learning it may not be easy for them to understand what's happening yeah i i i like that point i mean I think we faced a lot of these challenges as well in our research. I should say though that I think it was one direction that we could probe less because some of the features were masked. So it was hard for our partners to really understand the relationship, economic relationships between variables. So we weren't really focusing on that. Um, but I, I think there is there's a deep challenge here with understanding what a model does. And you mentioned that even a simple model may not be trivial to understand. Um, and I think our main finding here that I just wanted to reiterate from um, Laura Blattman's presentation earlier is really that therefore we have to be careful in interpreting explanations. Let it be simple, let it be complex models. Because if, if Molam and I here, are, we are different on a few things that are likely correlated with each other. So say we take salary, but we also take like the, the amount of mortgage on our, uh, the, the, the price of our houses, for example, like very highly correlated likely. So now if the model includes only one of them, that doesn't necessarily mean that I got the credit because of this, or I'm, I get treated differently because of that. It's just that people who differ along those dimensions, they are getting treated differently. And so what we found is that we have to be careful in interpretation. We have to understand these things in the context of their correlation, meaning that if I say, you know, two people get treated differently, um, and it seems to be that one important feature in that is um, the mortgage on their house, then maybe what I should understand that to mean is really um, all the differences that are also implied by that. So we can't just reduce it to these variables in isolation, because it's very hard to describe the functioning of a complex model in, in, few, in view of those few features. And I don't think that's my personal view, but I'm, I'm curious what you guys think. That's not necessarily solved by a simple model because just because a simple model only picks one of those variables doesn't mean that we are not treated differently along those dimensions as well once we look at the, once we look at the distribution of decisions. That's right. Yeah. Um, I, I would just add to this, right? You know, yes. the, the, the topic of correlation has been one that we've been, you know, working with as an industry for, for a very long time. Um, and so, you know, you could, you could say, well, what, what's different here, right? I mean, most people aren't going to put a lot of variables into regression. They shouldn't, right? Um, you know, most model development, if you go through a model governance process, they, they, you, you won't deploy a model with more than, you know, with 34 variables in order to register regression. It's just not responsible. You might do 14, right? Or you might look at, you know, other types of machine learning models, um, such as some of the interpretable models that isolate latent features. You know, when you when you do that and, and you constrain the degrees of freedom, right? Because this is not a high dimensional problem, right? We want to say it's a very complex problem, but it's it's really not, right? The the the, the number of dimensions that describe credit risk are not that uh, wide and, and varied. Um, you know, a properly built model may only excite one of those latent features at a time, and so you know they they actually can remove a lot of the correlation. So. You know, I, I think, you know, there is the sort of the, the I guess what I'd say is the naive way of, of building models where we just throw a lot of features in and allow the machine learning to sort it out. And then there's the kind of more practiced way that, you know, that a model governance team would, would take you through in terms of, hey, you know, you can't, you can't train this model if you don't have at least 500 or 1,000 exemplars of that for every weight in the model. And, hey, you need to show me out of time performance because I don't believe your performance is any better. It's in sample in time. Um, or, you know, you're going to choose an algorithm that specifically removes a lot of the correlation by design, right? One can argue, well, you're not capturing all the relationships, but, but in reality, right, um, th these algorithms, um, you know, end up capturing mostly noise and correlation and things that uh, as soon as it goes into production, right, whatever hard work you've done in the development is, is kind of thrown out the door, right? And, and this is a real, this is why monitoring is such a challenge. And you know, less than 10% of companies actually monitor these models after they get out of the lab. So we can all celebrate ourselves if we think we build a great complex model. But, you know, once it's out in the wild, right, that, that's where all the damage occurs because, you know, the performance tends to drop very considerably consider, compared to other models. And, 
um, you know, this concept, which I like to use a lot of bias drift occurs in a much more mm -hmm. um, severe way than mm -hmm. uh, you, you'd experience, let's say, with a simpler model. So, um, you know, I think that's some of the differences here is, 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 is why reducing that complexity reduces the correlation and makes it more understandable and, and more, you know, more ability for a human being or a monitoring system to, to ensure that it's doing the right things when it actually is to provide value. And that's on the first time it makes a decision outside the lab. Mm -hmm. um, Thanks, so, so, think, you, yeah, sorry. Please, so, so, if, if I can add one more comment on that, I, I think uh, often there is a lot of emphasis on, say, data validation or model validation, but not enough emphasis on monitoring, as Scott just mentioned. Um, so, monitoring has a lot of benefits. So, uh -huh. it's not just about, say, monitoring the performance of the model, but uh, even, say, monitoring or whether the model is developing biases over time due to maybe changes in real world conditions. Um, one of the re uh, aspects which is kind of related to maybe even feature attributions is that often in many settings like lending for instance we do not have access to the ground truth in say real time so it may be several months before we know whether the decision made by the model was correct or wrong so in those cases uh, even monitoring the feature attributions could potentially serve as a proxy for whether the model is degrading in performance. If the features which were really important before deployment turn out to be not as important post deployment, and if we keep monitoring that, that could be a signal that something is going wrong. Perhaps the relationship between the target variable and the input features, what's often called as a real concept drift, has perhaps changed. So I think that's also a, a potential connection between uh, feature attributions or yeah, mo explain monitoring explanations and impact on the performance of the model. That's very helpful. And I think we're now going back after, you know, discussing many of the challenges to going back to how we can actually use them. And so Adam, you started us off earlier also with presenting a few like directions and potential users of these models and how helpful they can be to them. I was curious what your take is on where we actually are on making these explanation actionable like do we actually serve these purposes right now? In which cases um, is your sense that existing tools are actually already actionable or helpful in, in the context of the specific use cases that, that you had started us out with? Yeah, absolutely. Good question. And I think, you know, one of the things I think it's really important to explicitly call out that I, that I haven't heard mentioned, but it's kind of really fundamental to answering these questions is the fact that when you talk about credit risk, credit decision, and credit underwriting, it's never just like one model making a decision. Uh, it's a real, it's a big suite of models. And, you know, the models are focused not only on sort of the individual applying for, for credit, um, but also, you know, look internally looking at a bank's portfolio risk. And those models that are deciding on sort of like how portfolio risk factors in are, are often the product of many more models that are looking at different macroeconomic factors and making predictions about, you know, macroeconomic risk uh, with different associated with different um, different different groups of people. And so, um, you know, when you, when you break it down, like it, we're not just talking about explaining like a single simple model that that is going into this decision, like there are, you know, typically tens of models that are uh, that are all or, you know, 20, 30, 40 models that if you actually kind of like look Look at all the the data that's been built that's going into the final model and where it's coming from it's pretty extensive right and so if you if you take that challenge of like not only is it about you know having interpretable models or models that provide interpretation but there's also multiple models feeding into the decision process in different ways uh, and then you need to take that and map it to something like an adverse action code and with the adverse action codes Maybe your features line up with some of those adverse actions. Maybe they don't. Maybe you have models that are looking at like one set of conditions that lines up with the adverse action code, or maybe not. And sometimes it's a combination of those things. And so doing that mapping in any sort of authentic way is is really challenging. And so and it introduces just a lot of ambiguity into the into the mapping. And so um, you know it, it's a very difficult condition. And, and this is not a new problem to machine learning. Um, it's been around forever, but it's it's a huge challenge right now. And so I think. You know, uh, whether you're talking about sort of the loss of fidelity with going from complexity and using an inferred model, um, I, I think it's also really important to take the systems perspective and like how what a big um, what a big role systems design plays in in sort of the interpretability. Um, and I also have seen things like with these systems, you know, over time. Uh, so I, prior to starting Arthur, you know, um, 
I worked at an AI team, led an AI team at a large bank. And, you know, I've, I've talked to many of other large banks. And oftentimes what happens with these systems is because of the way the, the model validation process works um, under, you know, guidance of things like SR11-7 from the Fed, you know, putting new models into production is a very um, a bureaucratic and difficult process because it has to go through a lot of validation. And so what you see in, in practice across the industry is that, uh, you know, rather than, like if, if there's some sort of, um, risk that's detected with the model where it's not performing well, people will put in an adjustment or they'll put in a coefficient on a weight. And, um, and so even if you have a relatively simple model over time, these adjustments kind of build up. And so the interpretive, even if your original model is interpretable, the overall system becomes very uninterpretable very quickly as you put more duct tape and band-aids on it. And, uh, and so, you know, I think that, you know, any, any discussion of, of sort of model interpretability also has to understand that like algorithm, it's not about just choosing a single algorithm that's interpretable. It's like really designing your systems in a way uh, that, that, you know, you can make sense of and that are sort of maintainable over time and stay clean. Yeah. Um, thanks, I was actually, I, I think that's a great segue. And like, I wanted to ask you a little bit more the big picture question. We've talked about kind of more technical challenges that come with creating explanations, turning them into practice. And now you've already opened it up a little bit to the whole process that's important. Um, Laura, I, my question to you would be, you know, in the big picture, what degree of comfort do we actually need with being able to understand models to be able to then go all the way, put them in production? And where do you see the main um, technical hurdles, but also maybe the hurdles in terms of practical implementation um, that would be required for us to feel comfortable with the explainability tools we have, but then also using such um, machine learning models in practice? Yeah, I'll start by saying that um, there is no one standard of explainability that is required. Again, it's very, you know, use case specific, industry specific, but if we're talking about credit risk for financial uh, uh, financial services, that's high, right? Um, this, this bar is quite high that needs to be gotten over. Um, and there's a, um, a very high degree of comfort that needs to be provided across stakeholders. The stakeholders that Ad Adam was mentioning earlier, right? That's not just the team building the model, the team validating the model, uh, the business owners responsible for the P&L associated with that model, and then the end consumers that have decisions uh, from that model or that suite of models, as Adam notes, right? Because it is not just a model, right? Those suite of models um, has to also feel that they're being treated fairly. And I think that that's a, something that is of increasing importance and you're hearing more and more from the end consumer if they do not feel um, that they have the level of explainability or understanding or transparency to really feel that the decision that was made about them was fair, was just. Um, you're, you're hearing a lot more about that and we're seeing that that lenders care a lot more about that than they ever have in the, in the past, which is I think a great thing. So um, the, the bar is set quite high and it has to appeal across a, uh, a set of people that have often a very differing level of technical background and technical understanding. Um, so therefore, in order to get around those hurdles and challenges, it is not just about, you know, uh, the, the type of model that is chosen it is about the entire design of the process, right? Um, it is about the complexity choices that are made about that model. We talked a lot about simple versus complex. I couldn't agree more with what Scott had said about there's this, you know, uh, view out there that the, the more complex, the better. I absolutely agree that it's actually the simpler, the, the better, and, uh, and uh, the, the most simplistic model is actually the one that wins, especially when put into production for, for the reasons Scott mentioned around stability and uh, ability to generalize better than complex models. So that choice around model complexity, also extraordinarily important. So it, it, it runs through that whole process. And in order to do that, having systems, as Adam was talking about, and systems that talk to each other, as opposed to what we're often, often running into at, at uh, financial institutions where there's systems that don't communicate very well um, with each other. So systems that can, can speak with each other well to, to carry through the multiple stages of the processes is, I think, a big hurdle that we still need to get over. I think there's great progress being made, but there's a lot of, still, a lot of work that still needs to be done um, to ultimately see more uh, machine learning um, more complex models deployed into production for, for more high risk and high stakes use cases. Uh, thanks, Adia. So with that, actually, I would like to also open it, you know, to the group again before we go to some Q&A as well in the last few minutes and just, you know, ask the question, like, where do we actually stand with that for um, credit models? Like, what are some of the things that we think aren't solved yet and to which degree 
are some you know of those techniques actually ready for for prime time, and we have that comfort both in the process and and in the diagnostics that they that they deliver. So, any I'm just curious about you, you guys you guys' opinion on that if you want to chime in. I'll start with a quick uh, what we see. Um, a lot of talk about the value that that machine learning in the way that I think most people on the call would think about machine learning. So not um, kind of a, a logistic regression, which technically is machine learning, but uh, the advanced machine learning uh, uh, models, a lot of talk about it, not a lot of use. Select players, um, uh, especially uh, in the, the more regulated space using it. Um, select fintechs, um, but even a lot of fintechs that talk a lot about how um, I'll say advanced their their credit uh, underwriting models are when you actually get under the hood and start to look at those models. They are not um, looking across a thousand uh, different features. They are not using a, a black box method to evaluate credit risk. They are looking to what Scott's shared of uh, the actual model that's deployed into production is looking at tens of tens of variables. Now those variables or features were very thoughtfully created and thoughtfully selected. Um, and the, those models do well because of that thoughtful selection, but they're not just throwing a bunch of data into a, a black box and seeing what it spits out. So um, I, I think there's a lot more talk than, than um, actual implementation in the space uh, right now. And a lot of it is because of the um, explainability or transparency concerns that individuals have, um, the, the fears of, of uh, fairness uh, or lack of fairness, the fears of bias that individuals have, um, and uh, the you know, uh, uh, belief that sticking with status quo can be more comfortable and less risky, especially if you, you know, are, are in a seat that focuses on risk mitigation all day long. So, um, but, but it's changing. But, you know, if we look at status today, that's where I would put status today. <laughs> yeah, and, and I'd agree with that, right? I mean, I, I think, you know, many, many firms I mean, use machine learning to, to try to understand how to create better features to put into a, a safer technology they're more comfortable with. So for example, with certain types of alternative data, you know, what, what are the hyper relationships and rela that will get learned when you throw in rental information or, or, or social or something else that you want to experiment with? Um, but, but for many of, of, of the firms, right, um, you know, it is, it is a, it's a large sort of leap and they look for consistency, right? And that's something I think in, in, the, re, in the research results, we saw a lot of challenges with consistency. And so if, if you can't apply explainability methods and find consistency, it's gonna be very difficult to, to, to move from what is working very well in the industry today. And I won't say it's perfect, no one thinks it's perfect, um, but it could go, become much, much worse, right? These are tools and models that have an ability to, um, to really make some very bad decisions and, and worse decisions, right? So uh, I think people are very cautious. Again, if we treat this as high risk, as, as the EU would tell us to, right? Um, they're gonna be very cautious about this. So I don't see people jumping. I see people looking to do experiments. I see them being very thoughtful in those experiments. And frankly, um, since many of these functions report, you know, up one way or another up through a chief risk officer, they're going to basically put a success criteria on it, which is like, I have to see this level of lift and tell me what sort of risk am I taking from a transparency or, or explainability measure, right? And those are big hurdles because, frankly, unless you're starting to, to mine very unique uh, alternative data, this is a very well studied part of our industry, right? I mean, you know, if you went and just tried to build a better model just based on bureau attributes, um, you know, that's been studied for 30 years, right? And, and so there's not a lot more to mine there. Um, I think it's in these alternate areas where there could be some promise, but also, you know, the lack of confidence in, in the algorithms and the consistency is holding people back from taking some of those leaps, particularly if the, if the increment of value is not huge, right? And I think that's where I see a lot of the industry today. Yeah, we, we see the exact same trends that, that Laura and Scott uh, describe. But what we, what we also see is a lot of people starting to use some of these algorithms at sort of um, less sensitive areas, but still like high leverage. And so customer acquisition, customer servicing, any money laundering, uh, increasingly in different kinds of fraud. Um, and I think that's very appropriate, right? I think it's like appropriate that people who kind of control the keys to the kingdom with these credit models are, you know, approach it with skepticism until, you know, until, until it can really be proven out until the, the, you know, the, the things like being transparency and explainability and, and bias mitigation become uh, a little more proven and, and a little more ready, then that's a very appropriate stance. But, you know, the trend we see is that 
Um, we do see a lot more of these sort of, you know, uh, forward, like the, the newer algorithms, more complex algorithms are being deployed and they're sort of gradually working their way into sort of more sensitive areas. Uh, we also see the, we, when we talk to customers, we hear the same uh, trend as what the other panelists mentioned. Um, j just like what Adam mentioned, uh, we are also seeing that uh, uh, there is an appetite for more sophisticated machine learning techniques in, say, uh, adjacent areas, like, say, deciding who, which customer should be directed to a maybe preferred agent, which customer is perhaps high value customer so that they should be directed to an appropriate uh, type of customer support representative or churn prediction um, or uh, fraud detection, uh, AML and uh, other uh, adjacent domains, but not in underwriting directly. That's what I to say. Yeah, I was actually curious because uh, you were working not just you know, on, on financial modeling, but also across the board. Like, do you see similar questions around explainability and concerns like from a from big picture view or um, is, is uh, that very specific to financial modeling? Uh, I think it's more certainly much more sensitive here than it is in other contexts, but for reasons that, you know, go back to the beginning of the session, yeah, modelers want to understand what they're right. modeling and their management wants to understand as well. And you still see uh, there's a Zillow, uh, basically lost a lot of money a few months ago because they didn't understand sort of how their models were working in terms of uh, valuations of real estate and so on. So it's important everywhere. Uh, I think it's probably more important uh, here because there's so much scrutiny and, and it's a well, very well-studied problem. So. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. I think it's also, you know, um, now bringing the, the panel to end, it's like a, a nice point that, you know, explainability serves many purposes, which is where we started, including actually just making sure that the person building the model understands That's it well right. enough and can avoid... Um, it, it's just a bad model for everybody. And it's not just about the regulatory oversight, but of course here in financial services, we're also thinking about uh, potential um, outcomes that the regulator may care about. Um, and therefore we also need these tools for oversight. So which puts some extra pressure on, you know, which tools we should use and how, how we should interpret that. Um, so we actually have time. I saw a few questions in, in chat and under the q and I'm very thankful for them. I, I try to answer some of that, uh, some of that on there. Um, but I don't want to um, eat into the time for the rest of the schedule. And so would um, like to thank our panelists here. So thanks, Mohan, for joining me thank here you. in person, despite us not even offering Pleasure. you some water. No, there's, um, there's lunch on the other side of the okay, wall. So um, <laughs> also, thank you for uh, Krish, for Laura, Adam, and uh, Scott for, for joining us virtually today and taking the time to discuss this with us. And I, I would be really curious to have this again in five years and see how far we've come until then, because I think there's just a lot of movement and we hope that with these discussions and this research, we can clarify some of the open questions and opportunities in this area.